Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. A very warm welcome to uh, UCL Faculty of Laws, IBIL. Uh, my name is Pete Eckhart. I'm the, the Dean of UCL Laws. We are, of course, actually in the Institute uh, of Education, and I don't know whether there's any equivalence between the uh, Institute of Education or, or IBIL and the Faculty of Laws. Um, uh, there is, of course, an educational side uh, to this uh, event, I'm sure, and uh, my only task is really to welcome you and to congratulate IBIL and uh, Sir Robin Jacob and the whole team uh, looking after uh, IP in the faculty for bringing together tonight such a stellar cast of uh, speakers to address uh, the issue of equivalence and whether the genie is out of the bottle. I'm not going to take a, a view on that myself. There's clearly lots of lawyers who are out of the office tonight uh, since they seem to be all gathered here. Uh, and it really shows that IBIL is uh, on to something. A very warm welcome also to the very distinguished uh, judges who are joining us uh, from around the globe, literally uh, a, a tremendous uh, patent experts, and I'm sure we're going to have a very, very lively debate, and I wish you a wonderful evening. Robin, over to you. Thank you, Pete. Before we get going, I want to point something out. We have an amazing panel who've been willing to come here um, and, and debate this perennial question of equivalence in patents. Some of them have given decisions. Others may have given decisions but may have to do it again. <laughs> and others almost certainly will have to give a decision. So you can reasonably expect that they are going to have to be somewhat reticent at times. Uh, and this is a debate and discussion. Uh, and if you've all come here to learn the definitive views of the judges about what's going to happen in this case or that case or the other case, you can go now. There really is a big difference between a short debate and discussion of the problems and provisional views uh, and the view that a judge comes to when there's been a fought case. Mr. Justice McGarry talked about the pure purify, purifying ordeal of skilled argument on the specific facts of a contested case. Argued law is tough law. Everything that's said by anybody today is not argued law and is not tough law. Mr. Justice McGarry had to disagree with an authoritative textbook written by him. <laughs> <laughs> Secondly, you might have noticed that there's somebody much prettier than Lord Hoffman sitting next to me. <laughs> and Kate O'Malley very kindly agreed to come when Lord Hoffman said he couldn't make it. He gave a rather pathetic excuse. He said he was on his way abroad with his wife to celebrate their 60th wedding anniversary. So he ought to have known he couldn't have done this date by 60 years. <laughs> he has sent this. He remains of the opinion he was writing Kirin Amgen. <laughs> <laughs> and the paragraph 42 of his judgment says it all. put in his email, if literalism, literalism stands in the way of construing patent claims so as to give fair protection to the patentee, there are two things you can do. One is to adhere to literalism in construing the claims and evolve a doctrine of sup which supplements the claims by extended protection to equivalence. That's what the Americans have done. The other is to abandon literalism. So that's Lord Hoffman's contribution. As you will have seen, there's a bunch of questions. I'm not sure I'm, we're going to get through them all, or necessarily in a very logical order. But uh, g given that I, 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 we've come up with these, partly with some of the help of some of you. Uh, the, the first question is whether Lord Hoffman's saying there's only one exam question is now right or wrong. Is there, in English law, a freestanding doctrine of equivalence? So you construe the claim, perhaps by the Kirin Amgen test, I'm not sure yet, 
And then, then they, even if the defendant doesn't fall within the claim, can he infringe? Uh, and that's a straightforward question. I'm going to ask David Newberger, who, who, who obviously knows about these things. <laughs> Not according to you. <laughs> Um, I, I just point out two things. Uh, it, it is slightly embarrassing for a, a judge, even a retired judge, uh, to have to comment on his own cases. Not so much because you think, oh God, I may have been wrong, although you sometimes do, uh, but um, because you are conscious that uh, the case, for better or for worse, is an authority till the Supreme Court says it was wrong. And un until that time, it stands, and anything one says about it um, could be embarrassing for judges in other courts because somebody cites the case and then the other side says Lord Newberger said something rather different about it at a later stage. So I feel slightly uh, hampered. Secondly, um, on the McGarry story, he did indeed, in his judgment in Cordell and Second Clanfield, um, depart from what he'd said in his book, saying that argued law in court was much more reliable than what was uh, in, in any book. Uh, but what uh, history goes on to say is that subsequently the Court of Appeal held that his book was right and the judge <laughs> in the St. Edmundsbury number two case. Um, I, think, I think that, that the difficulty with the Hoffman approach in Kieran Amgen is that it's, it's quite difficult to reconcile, I think, and I, this is what I said in... in, in the, um, in, in the activist case, with what he, what he said um, in Improver. Because if it really is interpretation, as he says, then he needn't have gone into the three questions in Improver, because there's no way that the coiled helical spring, as a matter of construction, could have covered a slotted rubber rod. So, in, 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 in my view, it cannot simply be construction. If the exercise in Improver was right, then the Kieran Amgen analysis is oversimple because it just doesn't, as a matter of language, cover what was there. I think that the, 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 we, we really took the view, in our case, that Improver was fine, but that it was too narrow a distinction to say... Uh, that a variant had to be, would obviously work as at the date of the patent uh, to the uh, notional reader. Um, I, I think that in, in, in those circumstances, um, I think that all we did in practice was to say, yes, there is a law of equivalence, and we said there was, there were equivalents, uh, because that's what the EPC legislation said. And having said there are equivalents, it was a bit rum not to adopt that as part of our approach. Jonathan, do you want to add to that? No, I, mean, I, I entirely agree with that. The problem about treating it as a, a matter of construction is that if you take that injunction seriously, you end up having uh, no regard to equivalence. Uh, whereas the statute requires us to have due regard to equivalence. And that is actually the position which Lord Hoffman, I think, uh, ended up in. Basically, he didn't like equivalence. He said it had done no good to the Americans, with the implication that it ought not to be doing it, uh, any harm to us. But that's not really an appropriate question when you're construing a statute which includes a requirement that one has due regard to the concept. <coughs> Well, has the doctrine of equivalence done any harm in the United States? Would you be happy to see it done away with, Kate? Um, I, don't, I actually don't think so. I mean, it, part of the problem is, I guess, we have so many exceptions to the doctrine of equivalence in the United States that, that it's not clear how much is left of it. Um, but in our instance, I, I, after watching all of the, the EU countries and, and the UK sort of struggle over whether it's a question of interpretation or a question of equivalence, you got to give the Supreme Court credit for just coming right out and saying, we get it. We get the fact that, that by uh, adopting this doctrine of equivalence that we are being somewhat inconsistent with what we say when we talk about the importance of the claims. 
but we're going to recognize that inconsistency and live with it for policy reasons. Uh, but it is still a very narrow doctrine. I mean, we have prosecution history estoppel. We have what we refer to as the ensnarement concept. In other words, you can't read on the prior art and, and, and claim equivalence for something that you couldn't have gotten a patent for. Um, and there is a, a very uh, detailed analysis of, of whether or not in the specification you made it clear that you wanted a very narrow claim. So I don't think that we see a lot of uh, DOE claims now um, that, that survive. We see a few. Uh, and we just recently had a case involving one where even at the preliminary injunction stage, the court uh, applied DOE to, or the likelihood of establishing DOE to, to grant an injunction. Um, so it, it's still there, but, it, but it's not that prevalent. How prevalent is it in Holland? Um, well, <clears throat> I must say the Dutch approach um, is very much in line with the, the present approach in the UK, um, since we also have a two-step test, uh, I think it's fair to say. Um, the first being construction, um, and construction um, would to a very large extent also um, include what I think was meant by purposive construction. Um, so you construe the claim already in the context of the description and the common general knowledge um, and then you see, um, you know, what, it's, what, it's, what it means. Um, but there are clear limitations um, to um, what you can do with purposive construction. Um, you know, if it says it's blue, um, it's very difficult to construe it to be um, uh, purple, for instance. So um, where there's, there's clear uh, limits to what construction can do, um, then we can have an equivalence test in addition to it um, and the test that we uh, usually use is um, borrowed from the United States. It's the function way result test, or in chemical cases, sometimes also the insubstantial differences test. Um, but certainly it's also a two-stage um, test. Um, and since we do construction on a purposive way, um, the question of equivalence doesn't come up that often. Um, but it's, uh, it's certainly not... Um, very rare. I mean, it, it, it does come up, um, and we do take it into account. Peter, what, what, two things about German law. One is, how often does the doctrine get applied? Is it lots of cases or only a few? Uh, and secondly, um, now let's have that one first. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Are you always told when you're learning to, when you're a law student learning to cross-examine or examine in chief? Just one question and it's all. <laughs> please, please allow a short remark in advance, relatively short. It's, it's almost 30 years ago that I was a young judge at the Düsseldorf uh, Landgericht and had to decide a case uh, as a member of the fourth civil chamber to decide a case which should become the famous epilator improver. <laughs> Uh, a, a case. Um, it, it, in our view, it was not a spe very spectacular ca case. One thing was a bit extraordinary. The, the patentee applied for preliminary injunctive relief, which uh, didn't happen uh, so uh, much in Germany, and the uh, same is true t today. Uh, we granted injunctive relief. Um, and in England, Mr. Justice Falconer denied, refused uh, the respective uh, application. In the appeal proceedings, it went the other way around. Our Oberlandesgericht um, um, denied uh, injunctive relief, <laughs> and the, the English, uh, the, the Court of Appeal granted, granted it. <laughs> well, then, the whole justice was being done. <laughs> <laughs> then it came to the, oh, yes. uh, the proceedings on the merits, and again we decided in favor uh, of the patentee, and Mr. Uh, Justice Hoffman, as it then was, decided again in favor of the uh, defendant. The results were different, but we didn't care too much. We, 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 we know, neither we know the judges uh, who decided the case in England, nor were we in any way familiar with uh, um, uh, jurisprudence uh, they considered. 
And so much has changed uh, since 1988. We, we, all of us went a long uh, way. And it's not only the jurisprudence of the House of Lords and the UK uh, Supreme Court which developed. It's also uh, the jurisprudence of the Bundesgerichts of uh, um, the German um, uh, Federal Supreme Court and the, the jurisprudence of the Dutch Supreme Court and of many other uh, <coughs> courts and Supreme Courts of, of, of member states. So the key point of the Pemichexit uh, case, I think, is that Article 69 sets more than the, of course, fundamental quest, uh, rule uh, that you have to ask what a skilled person would have understood the patentee to have used the language of the claim to mean. It sets the question, what is the extent of protection conferred by the European patent which contains the respective claim? The extent of protection shall be determined, bestimmt in German, déterminé en français, shall be determined by the claim. The claim as interpreted by using the description and the drawing is a decisive, the determining factor. So I think it's not a freestanding doctrine of equivalence. It's, if you want to call it a doctrine, it's a claim-based doctrine. And I think it's a, a, a huge advantage that we can now uh, discuss in Europe all further questions on the basis that we construe the claim first and then ask whether this claim provides for a wider uh, scope of protection, which is at least in most cases defined by uh, equivalence. We do it from time to time, and we did it much uh, more often than it, uh, it happens today, uh, and I think the the scope of protection of the concept of equivalence, it's, it's a bit narrower than it was, uh, let's say, uh, 20 or 30 years ago when we, and the result, the improver case, was much more obvious, at least to me, than it is today. Uh, today I could, can live much better with both solutions, which so the solution we find uh, when we decided the case and uh, also with the solution um, uh, uh, Lenny Hoffman uh, found when he decided the case. Yeah, I, I'll just disclose something. I was counsel for Improver in Hong Kong, fully expecting to lose in Hong Kong because Hong Kong judges were bound to follow Lenny Hoffman, and indeed I did. But I got quite enthusiastic about my chances in the Privy Council, that mean before Hong Kong had gone back to China. And the argument I was going to run was not exactly a freestanding doctrine of equivalence, but that you could take the essential aspect of, some, of a claimed item and say, well, has he taken that? And what was essential about the, the helical spring from the point of view of the invention wasn't the fact that it was helical, it was that it opened and closed. And that was the argument I was going to run in the, in, in the Privy Council. Uh, 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 sadly, and it just shows how clients can't always behave properly, this case settled. <laughs> <laughs> Before it got to any Supreme Court anywhere, it should have gone to Supreme Courts all around the world. Uh, it settled because the American patent issued. And the defendants were advised very firmly that the doctrine of equivalence would kill them in America. Would it have done so, Kate? A rubber rod instead of a helical spring, but doing the same job? You know, it, it's yeah. actually, that's a good question, because the way the doctrine of equivalence is structured today, I think it is less likely that, that we would deem there to be insubstantial differences between the two. Um, having said that, if in, at the time when we were applying the function way result test, that um, the only question here obviously would be the way. It's the same result, it's the same function, but is it really the same way? And that might have actually turned on, um, because we look at equivalence from the day of infringement, so it might have actually turned on whether this new 
method was something that came up later, later arising, that people hadn't actually contemplated, um, but that wasn't that creative. Um, and if that was the case, it's more likely that the doctrine of equivalence would have ensnared it. Right, let's move on to a, a different subject. That's my question for. Is it fair to third parties to provide the patentee protection by way of a doctrine of equivalence if the patentee could have claimed the equivalent but didn't do so? So, for example, he says two things are screwed together and the defendant uses glue. Why would that be fair protection to give him something he could have claimed which he didn't claim and he could have done? Leanne? Well, first of all, I think the protocol requires a balance to be struck between reasonable protection for the patentee and legal certainty for the third parties. Now, by its nature, it's really impossible to serve both uh, optimally, optimally without detriment um, to the other. So it's always a compromise between the two. So there may be situations where a variant is so obvious um, that if not claimed, it may be held against legal certainty to allow protection for it under the doctrine of equivalence. And a clear example of that, I think, is the occluder case, um, which you'll um, know from various jurisdictions, where the variant with one clamp was explicitly mentioned in the description, but was nevertheless not claimed. But the criterion in the question could have claimed, I think, is far too far reaching. Because in theory, anything obvious at a priority date could have been claimed you know, by that token. So it being obvious at the priority date, um, being this, at the same time the criterion for equivalence, um, I think it would make it a dead letter. So um, my question, uh, my, the answer to my question is, um, could have claimed is not the right criterion to, to decide on equivalence. Jonathan? Well, I don't actually think it's relevant uh, whether the um, patentee could have claimed um, something different. The whole question of infringement arises um, at a stage when you have to take the claim uh, as it is with the doctrine of equivalence uh, super added. So I'm not sure that it's uh, meaningful to ask whether it's fair. Um, uh, it's not meaningful for a different reason as well which is equivalence is part of our law. And uh, as a judge, it doesn't actually matter whether you think it's fair or not. It, well, it's, it, it's there. Well, well, Paul, <laughs> wait a minute. It's, it, it's, so is fairness, because that's, that's in the protocol too. Fair protection, uh, reasonable certainty to the third party. Well, the so assumption that's being made is that, it, is that equivalence is fair, and that's the assumption from which we, we took as our starting point. What do you say about that, David? Well, I think I would add to that the simple point that fairness is a fairly flexible concept and a lot depends <laughs> on how you're looking at it. But you can well see from the patentee's point of view that if somebody thinks of a clever way of putting two things together or a way that has been overlooked in the description or in the claim, it's a bit unfair that that should simply enable an other, a person who would otherwise infringe to get round the patent. Other people might say, good luck to him. But I find fairness a nice concept in general, but to apply in principle is a quite a f difficult concept because there's so much room for different views. <coughs> Opposing views. He said, I'm worried about it. The chap has said, I, I, for reasons you don't know why, but he says they're glued together. And it's obviously you could screw them. But he, yeah, yes, it, it, is, it is almost in any case possible to, to avoid the problem of including equivalence in the scope of protection by drafting pure <coughs> means plus function claims. Mm. Then you need no concept of equivalence because if the function is fulfilled, the, the, the claim is infringed. But on the one hand, examiners do not like uh, such 
uh, means plus, plus function uh, claims. On the other hand, they are necessarily very broad and not really colorful to uh, the reader. I explicitly mentioning each and every equivalent may be possible in some cases, but doing so will cause monstrous uh, claims. But nevertheless, loopholes, because the applicant forgot one of dozens of possible uh, variants. Therefore, I never believed in the concept of foreseeable equivalence that they should exclude applying the, the, the concept of equivalence. Um, I do not think it's unfair. It depends on how the equivalence doctrine is handled. Uh, if you uh, look at the identity of the technical result, if you look at the obviousness of this identical technical uh, result, and if the necessary consideration of the skilled person are based on the technical meaning of the claim, on the essence of the claim, as a Dutch formula um, <laughs> uh, says, um, if the effect is immaterial in view of the uh, technical teaching of the claim, then it is, it's foreseeable for the infringer, and I think it's not unfair. Yeah, it, it, there is a slight oddity, isn't there? If you think of the Oculotech case, where the patentee described something and then didn't claim it, you say, well, that's too bad. You really didn't mean it to have it. You shouldn't have it. That is one but, but thing we he, learned from, from yeah. the, our English fellow judges, that in this case, equivalence should be excluded. Yeah. So that is what we but if, if, if it's not expressly mentioned by the patentee, but everybody would have known that he would have known about it and his reader would know about it, why is that different from him actually mentioning it? So, or putting it in concrete terms, if the patent said glued or screwed, and then he only claimed glued, you would say, applying Oculotech, well, he's not getting... The other one was, I forget what. <laughs> <laughs> Screwed. That's he's true. not getting screwed. He's not getting screwed, eh? <laughs> <laughs> so but, but if he, if he doesn't actually mention the alternatives, yeah, yeah. It's, it's different. The, the point is, if both alternatives are disclosed in the description and in the application as filed, it's possible to have a claim which covers uh, both alternatives as long as both alternatives are patentable. Um, but, uh, yeah, if equivalent, var var equivalent var variants which are not disclosed cannot be included in a claim. You have to disclose them in the application as filed, otherwise the examiner will refuse a claim which covers not clearly and unambiguously disclosed uh, alternatives to the, uh, to the uh, solution which is explicitly mentioned in the description. So uh, the, 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 the options are different in both cases for the applicant and on the, other, on the one hand and to the reader skilled in the art on the other hand. Right. Um, there was some hesitation in activists as to whether Improver would be decided the same way today. Why the hesitation? Surely the three-part test is entirely satisfied with, by, by the Improver alleged infringement. David? I think that one is very reluctant in a judgment uh, to overrule or approve a decision which is not in front of you at the time. You haven't heard argument on it. Uh, you have analyzed it and considered it, but you haven't directly heard argument on it. And it may be that I was unnecessarily precious about it, but um, I, 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 I think one would rather not decide that. I suspect, speaking out of court, uh, that it, it, it probably would have been decided differently. I think, yeah. I would have won in the Privy Council. Good. <laughs> but that would have been your advocacy. <laughs> and if it had been decided differently, uh, it would have been because of question one. Uh, I think it would, have, it, 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 would have, it would have depended on whether, in fact, it did work in the same way. 
Well, Lily said it did. So he found that far, as a matter of fact. The Dutch courts decide in favor in favor of the plaintiff now. Um, well, that's that's hard to tell without the facts. But um, on, on on the facts as I understand them, um, when decided um, in 1992, I think it was, um, th they held that the um, the rubber rod um, worked in essentially the same way, and there were no material structural differences. Um, they held the core of the invention um, to be the, the hair plugging instrument working in a mechanical way, sort of, um, in summary. Um, so, um, taken by those facts, um, I, can't, uh, I can't exclude that the decision would still be the same. Um, but by the same token, I should also say that, as in Germany, um, room for equivalence has gone down a bit. Um, so um, it's hard to predict. Well, the patents expired. There we go. It's an interesting thing. Blanco White observed. Sometimes you have a patent and you have a very popular product. And the theory of the patent law is when the patent expires, everybody can make it. When you can't buy these things for love nor money now. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to get some on the internet, some old ones if for, for, for students, but you can't get them. Um, I'm going to ask the same question about Kirin Amgen. I, David, I should tell you, the president of the Swiss Federal Patent Court has described um, activists as Newberger's Revenge. <laughs> what about Kirin Amgen? Would that be decided in the same way now? Or is that at least a question, an open question? Uh, I... I... Again, dangerous to discuss, or particularly a judgment, but even here, a, a, a case where, where you haven't had full argument, and even more dangerous for a judge uh, who decided it and was overruled to discuss it. <laughs> uh, but um, my, my suspicion is, my, if I had to put, put my own view on it, which I do because you've asked me and I'm prepared to answer, <laughs> I would say the decision of the uh, House of Lords in Kiranamjan would be the same. I think we are in slightly odd territory uh, with um, DNA and so on, uh, with, um, you, you were good enough to tell me uh, about, about this, so I think, it, it, yes, it's 29.2, isn't it, and 29.1 of the EPC, quite what they mean might have to be looked at quite carefully, but we are not in the realms of a normal patent, we're in the realms of a patent covered by Rule 29, and I, I would have thought uh, that you could well argue that the way uh, the uh, gene um, or the gene sequence is uh, activated and the way it is, is uh, used to produce erythropoietin is part of the invention, such that you would say uh, that it was not did not work in the same way. So to pick up Jonathan Sumption's point, it falls at the article one, at the, at the question one. Uh, but I, I have to say that, that, that that's not something I thought through very fully, and have only did so when you told me I was going to be asked this question. <laughs> I, 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 I'm afraid if I was sitting in the Supreme Court and Kieran Amgen came up now, I would say that Mr. Justice Newberger was still wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, sometimes you change your mind. It was Lord Justice Bowen in the last in the 19th century who once had a case in which he decided, cited to him. He says, it doesn't seem to me now as it seems to have seemed to me then. <laughs> um, what effect does the doctrine of equivalence have on the validity of patents? Um, a lot of people have been asking that question. Uh, for example, first of all, where the patent has a particular claim element, which was the basis of the invention. It was a non-obvious compared with the prior art. In the prior art is 
the equivalent. So the patent is plainly valid over the prior art, having this inventive element. But would it cover the prior art? And if not, why not? Maybe? That was not a point that was considered or discussed, and I would have thought that the patent, if it did contain, if it did have an inventive concept, would cover what it covered, but if there was an aspect that might otherwise be within the doctrine of equivalence, which was a part of the prior art, then it wouldn't cover that. That's what the German position is, isn't it, essentially? Formstein 3? Formstein, uh, uh, one of the problems I had with the Kieran Emlin approach was always that if you uh, treat uh, equivalence as part of claim construction, uh, it should be considered by the patent office when deciding whether the subject matter of the claim is obvious uh, having regard to prior art. But that is not possible because you cannot imagine all feasible, imaginable uh, alternatives to different features of the claim. What the patent office examines is the subject matter of the claim as properly construed. At least that is what we expect them to do, but sometimes also this first step is difficult because they are not really uh, inclined to uh, construe the claim before examining um, State of the art, uh, prior art documents, they take it more or less, they take the literal wording of the claim and uh, ask whether what is uh, covered by this literal, uh, literally understood uh, claim is obvious uh, having the right to prior art. But if you have the, this difference, it, it is possible that obviousness has to be decided differently in case of the equivalent solution because it wasn't examined and it may be, may be obvious uh, having a regard to prior art. That is the situation which is addressed by our so-called Formstein uh, defense. Uh, it's a defense available in the infringement proceedings in Germany, although we do not examine ex uh, validity of the patent. In suit, we examine validity of this equivalent uh, have any regard to prior art, but but it happens uh, almost uh, never uh, uh, that uh, a defendant tries to uh, um, uh, uh, to um, argue the Formstein uh, defense, and it happens never ever that he succeeds in uh, uh, um, using the Formstein defense. In most cases. The, if the Formstein defense worked, it would in, mo in most cases also mean that the patent is invalid. And then, um, because the difference is very seldom so huge that you have dif uh, that different views of the patent as uh, patent claim as granted and the equivalent variant are justified. So the result in, in most cases may be the same as the validity. Kate, is it still a, 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 a sort of fundamental principle of American patent law that a patent cannot cover that which is old or obvious? Well, yes. Uh, Doctrine equivalence, construction or whatever. The, we, have a, we have a concept, and, and I have a caveat to this in a second, but we have a concept that says, we, it, it's a, called the principle of ensnarement. You cannot ensnare with a doctrine of equivalence claim that which would have been obvious and therefore you could not have gotten through the patent office as part of your claim to begin with. Um, the, so that we do tie the two together. The problem is, and this is my caveat, the Supreme Court, uh, our Supreme Court recently issued a decision um, in the Connell case in which it said, to my surprise, because I was one of the ones over ruled, um, that, uh, it happens. That, yeah, um, <laughs> that infringement and validity are t totally different things. And while we always proceeded on the assumption that you can't infringe an invalid patent, apparently the Supreme Court has said you 
to divorce the two inquiries. Um, if, in fact, we were to apply Kamel in this context, then it's possible that the way we analyze ensnarement in connection with the DOE analysis uh, would no longer be viable. Um, I, I don't think the Supreme Court thought about the, the broader consequences of its broad statement in that case. Um, it was in connection with a, um, a question with, uh, regarding uh, divided infringement, indirect infringement. Um, so I don't know that, that it would go so far as to say, oh yeah, that's what we meant for all purposes. But, but that does raise a question. We're still applying the ensnarement uh, concept, and we just did it recently in a case that came out of the Federal Circuit um, uh, that is now subject to a petition for rehearing. Um, but, uh, so we do tie the two together and don't allow you to bring a DOE claim if it would have been obvious. Jonathan, do you have views on this? I have nothing to add. <laughs> <laughs> no, except that we don't call it Formstein, but we call it um, Gillette after your... Oh, you just think dear old Gillette. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's the one thing. Look, at the one bit of pattern more survived. I, I should say, my friend Martin Edelman, he says that patents are too difficult for Supreme Courts. <laughs> 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 on the Supreme Court. Yeah. It depends even more on whether you agree with their decisions. Now, uh, uh, a, a patent attorney sent in a question about, about, about numerical limits in claims. Because a lot of patent claims, not more than 20%, or up between 10 and 15%, or 20, uh, between 30 and 70 degrees centigrade, or whatever. Um, the question is, do, do these claim limitations mean anything anymore from the point of view of the extensive protection of the patent? Or does it just, doesn't matter what the number the patent, patent agent puts in, it's going to be everything that works? We, we got near having to consider this when we granted permission to appeal in a decision of the Court of Appeal, Smith and Nephew and Convitec technologies, where um, it was a, a, a treatment for wounds, I think, and the amount of silver was between X percent and Y percent. And the Court of Appeal held that there was no, there was infringement, even though the amount of silver in the allegedly infringing product was, I think, greater than the higher of the two figures. Um, Possibly inconsistently, some might say, with the activist case, I was attracted, although we didn't hear argument because the case subsequently settled, I was attracted by, quite attracted by the point that where parties have specifically defined two limits, where they've bookended their claim, where, where, the, where the patent has bookended the claim, if you like, uh, that that was a clear enough indication that they didn't intend to go outside it. But I think much might depend on reading the claims in the context of the specification, uh, which might throw further light on it. And it may be that you can't lay down absolutely any, a general rule about such claims, uh, as much may depend on what the context, i.e. the specification. But it's an interesting point, and one that would have been argued out if Smith and Nephew in this country, in the Supreme Court, if Smith and Nephew hadn't settled. Kate, what do you do with numerical limits? You know, it, the reality with numerical limitations and claims is that very often there's a very good reason for the numerical limitations, and that's because if any other numerical li limitation would have read on the prior art. So we all, I, I will often see a case like this and say, why aren't they arguing DOE? And then we'll look and realize it's because the prior art had a different scope. Um, so we actually don't see as many DOE claims in numerical limitation cases um, as you would think for that very reason, is that the limitation is created uh, because of um, the need to avoid prior art. Having said that, there, there obviously are exceptions, and I think that, 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 that DOE would allow some variance from the numerical limitations as long as there was evidence that the numerical limitations were not critical 
Um, and the question is, how far outside those numerical limitations does the question of criticality go? So I think that it could be true that, that if there isn't a prior art problem, that there would be a DOE that would at least allow you to capture something slightly beyond those, those limitations, as long as uh, it was clear that, that the limitations themselves, or that at least at the margins, that they were not critical. In Warner Jenkins, Jenkins or Jenkinson, I forget which Jenkinson. Point. Jenkinson. Um, the claim was didn't really quite raise the point because it said about, mm -hmm. and that gives you a bit of wiggle room. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's very often what you'll see in the claim is about or approximately, um, and so therefore you've got automatically the ability to, to analyze the question a little more broadly. Do you want to add on? Well, the way that this would impact on um, equivalence is by way of question three. The argument would be that the parties, by choosing a range, had indicated with precision um, how much leeway there was. Mm -hmm. And that's not an argument that would necessarily prevail in every case. It would depend on the factual and technical background. Yeah, but that's the way that it would be used. Mm -hmm. yeah. <coughs> I actually had one of those exceptional cases myself, um, where we did accept infringement under the doctrine of equivalence. Um, it was a, a case about an emulsion, um, and the range was about particle sizes. Um, and the particle size um, was not, um, it was an average, so to say. So most of the article, particles were inside the range, um, and some of them you know, would be outside. So, um, and then we also construed the claim, um, you know, that they should be, the particle size should be, you know, about that size. And it didn't really matter that, you know, some were um, slightly outside the range. Something like that, I didn't look it up, but as I remember it. Um, so, but as a general rule, I think it would be quite difficult um, to argue an equivalence case in a numerical case. Um, but there are exceptions. Yeah. I, I fully agree with what Lord Justice Jacob said in Rockwater. It follows that if the patentee has included what is obviously a deliberate limitation in his claim, it must have a meaning. And it's especially true for numerical, uh, uh, numerically defined f features. And it is in accordance with uh, uh, our uh, jurisprudence in a very similar statement in the Schneidmesser cutting blade case where we said the inclusion of figures and measures in the claim makes it clear that they are intended to participate in defining and hence also limiting the subject matter of the patent. Consequently, such details must not be regarded as less binding, merely exemplary statements of the protected technical teaching as was held to be possible in the jurisprudence of the Reichsgericht and this court before Article 69 EBC and the corresponding national amendments uh, uh, came into force. So I think so equivalence is not excluded, but there's a very narrow uh, range for, for equivalent solutions. I haven't asked you yet, anybody, about Article 84 of the EPC. Because I'm not sure it was argued in front of the Supreme Court. Um, this is part of the fundamental structure. And it says the claims must clearly define the matter for which protection is sought. How does the doctrine of equivalence square with that at all? Did, did you have any argument about the Article 84? I it's don't not, recall it. No, we don't. No, I, I think you would have bound to refer to it. Um, well, you probably don't things. want to answer the question now, but I mean, it's, it's, it's a bit difficult. But, well, ex except that you've still got the reference to equivalence in 69.2. In the protocol? Mm. It just yeah. I mean, admittedly, you can ignore the protocol, but it seems a bit unlikely. It also, well, the matter for which protection is sought is quite. not the same as yes. the extent of the protection. Mm. Mm. Yes. That sounds a bit Hegelian. That is marvelous. I see. I don't know what the Germans. Are. Yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what the German or French is is 
But it's yes. different. It's different concepts, isn't it? Yes. I mean, one yes. one is a clear wording of the claims. You know, if you put in vertical, you know, to use the catnick, you know, vertical is a clear wording, but apparently it was not clear what it meant and what the scope of protection was, because the scope was extended to be vertical enough to do the job, which included more than 90, 19 degrees. So yes. th there you go. It was a clear claim, but again, there was a lot of discussion about you know, the scope of it. Actually, it turned out, I heard some stories about the, the defendants, lintels and things, but it was five degrees off. Some of them started failing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know that's true or not. I, I think that's an important um, 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 point because I think it, it fits perfectly um, because the subject matter of the claim is one thing, the scope of protection attributed to this subject matter is another thing, and the patent office has to deal with the first one, and with the first one only, uh, in accordance with Article 84, mm -hmm. and the claims must not be directed to anything what is not clearly and unambiguously disclosed in the application as filed, and that is the, uh, the area which can be covered by the subject matter of a claim. But, yeah. And then Article 69 comes into play, not in the patent office, but in the infringement proceedings. A, a question that came from a, a, a very well-respected patent attorney um, was, can the panel suggest a form of words to be used by someone who, wants, who actually wants to limit the scope of protection in this patent? He may go off and ask for divisionals with wider protection, but in this patent, he wants sodium and nothing else. What should he have said? Sodium and nothing else. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the sort of onus is to add that you don't want the equivalent. Well, one of the things that we look to is whether you um, discount or disparage um, everything other than yes. your, what you're claiming. So if you say that you know, the prior art wasn't good enough because it didn't use disodium or it, wasn't, it didn't have this level of stability or it didn't have this type of ion charge, then, then by discounting the alternatives, um, that is one way you can lock yourself in. Mm. Yeah. I all right, well, it's, it can be done. Um, can, well, let's turn to a bit of prosecution history of stock. First of all, somebody put this one. Can statements by the patentee to other patent offices during the prosecution of the parallel patent in that office be used to limit the doctrine of equivalence in, in the first country? So other patent offices, prosecution history of stop mm. I, I fully agree, and I always agreed with Lenny Hoffman's dictum that life is too short to consider <laughs> file history and all, and certainly life is too short to consider <laughs> file history from worldwide. Uh, yeah. uh, we have, we have very... Yeah. 100 patent offices, so yeah. I think We have very clear case law that says we will not look to other, the file history of other uh, patent offices. I know that a lot of people think we're crazy for looking at the file history from our own patent office, but um, having said that, that's as far as we take it. Um, now, you know, we have, with a few countries, Japan and South Korea, we've now developed protocols to start, try to, to harmonize our practices, so maybe over time that could change. But right now, the theory is we don't understand enough about the practices in the other offices. Um, we don't view that it would be necessarily something that one of skill in the art would have been, had available to them readily. Um, we don't know why the examiner's exchanges occur the way they do in other patent offices. So we just don't go down that road. Jonathan? Well, the position in English law is, at least now, very clear. Um, we. Uh, uh, only recognize exceptional circumstances in which the prosecution history is relevant, uh, even if it's a prosecution of a patent in the UK. A fortiori, that would apply elsewhere. 
Because well, you've had prosecution history of Stoffel some time in Holland, but have you well, ever had a foreign one? And also, you're, you're much more sort of international than a lot of other well, people. We, we are quite international, but not that international. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe it's, um, um, it's, it's, it's a good point in time to make some correction to, um, to one uh, paragraph in the uh, Supreme Court judgment. Um, where it said that only in case of um, uncertainty as to construction uh, one can turn to the um, prosecution file. Uh, because in fact, um, our Supreme Court held that a third party may always refer to the prosecution file, whether the claim upon construction would be clear or not. Um, and that that limitation would only um, apply to the patentee. Um, now, having said that, um, also another thing is that although often referred to as um, file history estoppel, um, we don't have a sort of estoppel um, um, doctrine as such. Um, the thing is, um, if, if the prosecution file is referred to and it appears from the file that the, the patent claim was restricted for purposes of obviousness or novelty issues, um, you cannot then subsequently go to court and say, well, can you please construe my claim in a broad way so as then to include um, the variants that were previously held to be um, non-obvious um, or, uh, obvious or not novel. So that's the way um, we use the file um, in, in, in our proceedings. Um, and since we're only looking at the patent at hand, which is a European patent with um, validity in the Netherlands, uh, we would only look at the file applicable to that. Yeah. Right. Um, as I put my questions, uh, this patent has been considered by some other European countries. And it turns out it was, I was wrong about two, it's three. And they're all first instance decisions. And the score is 2-1 against the Supreme Court at the moment. <laughs> but it's only first instance, so who knows what's going to happen next. But the Swiss Court has also found no infringement, essentially much the same reason as the Italian Court. And our, the question I want to ask is this. Um, can we get European patent law harmonised via national courts? Are we stuck with this kind of different answers in different places and different rules in different places. Ria? Well, we don't have UPC, so um, I'm afraid um, that's the way we, we have to do it. Um, but um, I think harmonization to a very large extent has been achieved already um, in Europe. Um, and the Supreme Court decision in the Pemetrexid case is a very good example of um, a further step towards harmonization in Europe. So, um, the point is that different decisions will always um, be a fact of life. Um, even within one jurisdiction, um, you see different uh, decisions in first instance on appeal and on the Supreme Court on the same case. So, you know, is it any different um, that there sometimes will be different decisions in other jurisdictions? So, it's a fact of life. Um, and I think, you know, very often um, the, the, the different decisions are sort of exaggerated in the sense that it's a, it's a cry for harmonization and, you know, you see we're not in, in line yet. But very often it's different um, evidence before the court. Um, it's a different, well, maybe procedural rules, which is not a very good thing, but sometimes a reason why the decision, decision came out uh, differently. And... You know, finally, it's also an appreciation of facts, and we are humans, so not everybody appreciates the fact in exactly the same way. So my answer is, you know, a UPC, you know, would be great for harmonization. Um, it would be the ideal way to obtain it, um, but I think the European courts are doing very well um, in obtaining it right now um, as we go along. Peter? Mm. Um, you really one, began one, last one of my... Uh, um, predecessors used to say our decisions are finally final not because they are correct but they are correct because they are final <laughs> <laughs> and 
Same, same, same is true for this pro problem. If you have a UPC, we have a single court which uh, decides the case and uh, there will be a certain outcome of the case and that will be the final outcome and therefore it will be the right one. Um, as long as we have different uh, national courts, we, we, we may come to different uh, conclusions. But I, I agree, uh, fully agree with Rian that we uh, have made headway uh, uh, on, uh, we, we harmonized our practice a lot and uh, the permatrexit case I think is a um, very important a step uh, to a more uniform application of uh, Article 69 um, um, EPC. You welcome the activist decision, you, you welcome it too, do you really? Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to ask the audience in one moment, and I'm going to divide it between lawyers and patent attorneys. <laughs> um, I, I want to ask you, Kate, about if activists had been a United States case, would file up and stop would have worked? Um, yes. <laughs> yes, I think that, that uh, putting aside the question of whether or not there were insubstantial differences in, in terms of the, the chemical compounds, if you got past that, you'd still have the problem of the, the prosecution history estoppel, or fire rebel estoppel, as we used to call it. The, the, the difference is, is that our, we would not have felt or, not, or were not allowed to feel, according to the Supreme Court of Festo, the ability to say, well, the examiner asked for this limitation, but, but the examiner was wrong, or the examiner shouldn't have asked for that limitation because it, it's because he didn't really understand the chemistry, or he didn't understand the importance of it. Um, our view is if an examiner asks for a limitation, you have two choices. You can either appeal uh, from that decision and say that the examiner was wrong, or you can accept the limitation and then you are bound by that limitation. Um, and while I understand the practical reality is many times the reason that you accept the limitation is because you just want to be done with the examiner and you want to get out of there and move <laughs> on with your claims. Um, but having said that, um, after Festo, it's very clear that we assume that if you accept a narrowing limitation, that you then have to live with that narrowing limitation. There's a, you know, very little room at that point to argue that, that there's anything left in terms of your ability to, to argue doctrinal equivalence. So in this particular case, with those kinds of narrowing limitations, I think it would be pretty clear that the Supreme Court, or that our court, uh, probably wouldn't have gotten to the Supreme Court, our court would have applied prosecution history estoppel and it would have been over. I think the case shows that it is highly dangerous to, 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 to mix up prosecution history and, and the question of uh, scope of patent protection. What did the examiner do? The applicant asked for broad protection, of course. He wanted to have a claim which covered any antifolate combined with uh, vitamin B12. The examiner refused that and said the only compound you have showed to work is permetrexid. And then, of course, what the applicant wanted to have is a claim which covered any salt form of permetrexid. But the examiner said, you showed only one, clearly and ambiguously, that is permetrexid disodium. Others may work, but you didn't show it. So it's not disclosed, and it, you cannot have a claim which covers any other salts and permetrexid disodium. But that is a that is, um, statement about what was originally clearly and unambiguously disclosed, period. That is, a, the examiner may, may have been wrong. As you, you, uh, you had some doubts about his view, I, I fully agree. If he was we, hopelessly wrong, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> if, we had, if, if we had to decide on the uh, 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 original disclosure, our view would probably have been uh, permetrexid disodium is only an example of a form uh, how this compound permetrexid combined with vit vitamin B12 works. It's not the only, necessarily the only way to carry out the invention. And I think it's not a good idea to, to restrict the scope of patent protection to the result of a right or wrong 
uh, assessment of what was uh, uh, directly uh, disclosed in the application as filed. If something is directly disclosed in the application as filed, you do not need equivalence. You can have a claim which covers what is uh, disclosed. The, all the whole purpose of the concept of equivalence is uh, to uh, come into play when it goes beyond uh, the direct and unambiguous disclosure and the uh, respective uh, subject matter of the claim. Let me just clarify. I completely agree with Lord Neuberger that, that, the, that the examiner got it wrong um, and should not have required that much of a narrowing limitation. Maybe, maybe some form of description of the need to have a salt or the need to have um, a solubilizer. But um, but my point is that we're just not even allowed to consider that fact. That we're only allowed to consider it through the vehicle of an appeal from the examiner's rejection. Right, well, I think we're gonna have one more, which is uh, really for the two members of the Supreme Court. The 1966 practice statement said the House of Lords, for the first time, is willing to depart from one of its previous decisions, but would bear in mind the danger of disturbing retrospectively the basis on which contract settlement of property and fiscal arrangements have been entered into. The question is about, what somebody, about somebody who has started some sort of factory in reliance on purposive construction of Kirin Amgen, but somebody now comes along and says, ah, oh, but you're making something which is covered by the doctrine of equivalence. What about that? Is that um, a departure from the practice statement, or is it perfectly okay to turn somebody into an infringer? Well, I think the first point is that um, I think Kieran Amgen rewrote the law, and um, if uh, it rewrote the law as we thought slightly wrongly, uh, it was right for us to say so. It wasn't as if it had been a long-standing decision. And as I say, uh, what would the judges in Kieran Amgen have said in answer to the question you've put about people constructing a factory at that time? <coughs> Whenever you change the law, you, you run this risk. Um, no suggestion, although of all the types of case in my experience in the Supreme Court, where there were applications for permission to appeal or appeals, particularly permissions to appeal. It was patent cases where we got most third-party representations as to the consequences of letting the court below's decision stand or be overturned. We got no submissions um, on, on this, many bodies suggesting that it would cause chaos, and it was not part of anyone's case. I freely admit that every time you change the law, you might end up disadvantaging somebody. Uh, I, and I'm interested to hear the relative infrequency uh, with which um, equivalents uh, are applied in other jurisdictions where they've been accepted, uh, which rather uh, supports the view that it's unlikely that there will be many cases of where there is a risk of this sort. I can't rule it out, but it was no part of anyone's case. And as I say, at the moment, I'm unpersuaded that it's a great risk, although I accept that it could be. Do you want to add anything to that? No. Or not. <laughs> well, now, um, I, I, we could go on, but we're not going to. But before we stop, uh, I just want to say something about the man on my right. David, <laughs> you were kind enough to make a speech when I pushed off. Yes. <laughs> and you put a lot of effort into it, much more than I'm going to put in today. <laughs> But it, I still can remember when we first met at a Gray's Inn, Lincoln's Inn, right. Amity dinner, and I said it to this bloke, and he was obviously, he did land all in town, you know, that's what he did. Uh, and he was obviously considering maybe he might be asked to go on the bench. It was still the days when you got asked and didn't have to ask. And I told him what a damn good job it was. I did. Because that wasn't the popular view then. I like to think I gave you good advice then, David. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> and I'm damn sure that whether you followed it or not, the course you took was really good for our law. And we've been very, very lucky to have you. Um, it's been a joy to work with you. I once sent him to Birmingham to hear a patent case about metal bashing. He did. Yeah. <laughs> um, and Henry Carl did it. He feels Henry did it, right? Yeah. And David followed me on circuits and memorably had a wonderful dinner with his clerk um, on Valentine's Day in Haverford West. <laughs> <laughs> he and Don sat there together with people looking at them. <laughs> You've had a wonderful time, and now you're going to have a wonderful time out of it. There's a lot more to life after you leave the bench than there is in it. David, thank you very much indeed, and I hope everybody else will thank you too. When I gave your valedictory, uh, you had a right of reply. So I will very briefly say, first of all, <laughs> I'm really touched, and I hadn't expected that. It's particularly kind, as I think you haven't agreed with all my decisions in fact. <laughs> <laughs> but the best thing, um, uh, the best joke um, that Robin played on me is when he was in charge of patents in the Court of Appeal, and I was master of the roles, and I said, give me a patent case, find me a patent case I should do. And Robin found one that was about lavatory rolls. <laughs> <laughs> lavatory paper rolls. Now, one other thing before we go. Uh, <laughs> because I want to take a vote. I want, and I'm going to do it between lawyers, first of all. How many lawyers think the Supreme Court decision is going to be a good thing for our law? And how many think not? Those who think it's going to be a good thing for the, our law? Quite a few. And how many think n not? Few more. Few more, yes. Patent attorneys, good thing for the law? Not such a good thing for the law? <laughs> <laughs> well, that surprised me because I would have thought that given the fact that Quite often you must be worried about whether you've got wide enough claims or not. Your insurance policies should have gone down. <laughs> you said good for the law, not good for the lawyers. <laughs> very well. Okay, thank you all very much indeed. Thank you for the panel, for those who have come a long way particularly, but also...